Good morning, everyone, or I guess good afternoon by now. Um, welcome to SciPy 2021, the afternoon tutorials. We're here with Logan Thomas for the introduction to numerical computing with NumPy. Logan's a scientific Python and machine learning instructor with Anthot. So you're in particularly good hands for this topic, and I will let him take it away now. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Introduction to Numerical Computing with NumPy. Uh, my name is Logan Thomas. I'll be your guide through the NumPy world today. So hopefully you're enjoying your SciPy uh, 2021 experience so far. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to take care of just a few housekeeping items um, that will hopefully make your experience with this tutorial, uh, tutorial that much better. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and as we always do, I always ask, can you see my screen? <laughs> um, so just let me know. Fantastic. Wonderful. So first you should have seen an email or some type of communication, um, directing you to the GitHub website for, or the GitHub repository for this tutorial. I'm going to put it in the chat so you have it. Um, but this repository has just a brief kind of installation guide for downloading the material, installing the necessary Python uh, packages for the tutorial. If you haven't created a virtual environment with the necessary Python packages at this point, or you don't really know what that means, I'd suggest launching Binder from this button here on that repository link. Um, and this is gonna launch kind of an interactive Jupyter server or you can kind of drop into a Python, an IPython shell, and run Jupyter Notebooks or follow along in a terminal um, with some of the exercises that we do. So I definitely encourage you to follow along with me when we start coding. Uh, there are a number of small exercises kind of sprinkled in. Uh, they're called give it a tries. They're really kind of meant to be short five minute exercises to solidify some of the things that we just covered. But throughout the tutorial, there also will be kind of longer exercises that try to combine some of those concepts together. So if you want to, you can launch a binder from uh, using this link. If you have kind of a setup on your local machine, that's, that's perfectly fine as well. I will say I, I highly encourage you to have the slides open or the, the PDF of the slides as we go through this tutorial. I'm gonna be switching between kind of the PDF and the terminal, I'm kind of going back and forth in live coding um, so that um, it makes it easier to kind of discuss and show you what's going on underneath the, um, underneath the hood, what's going on in the slides. So it's not just a static kind of representation. So go ahead and download the slides if you haven't done so uh, already. Um, a few other things, questions. If you have questions during the presentation, unfortunately there isn't really a way for you to <laughs> unmute yourself and, and ask those questions. So I'd say, please, um, yes, I can zoom in. Um, this is just the repository for the the class and the, the link is in the, the chat. Um, but back to questions, uh, please post your questions in the, the Q&A section of AirMeet. I'll do my best um, to monitor the chat. It's, it's always hard to kind of keep an eye on um, what I'm presenting, what I'm coding and the chat. Eric um, is, is here to help me a little bit with that as well. So I'm, uh, Eric's gonna try to facilitate that conversation and that discussion a little bit. If there is a question that um, warrants kind of him interrupting me and, and, and answering for the good of the audience. He'll do so. If not, he's going to try to um, uh, answer those in, in the chat. Um, so the slides, again, are in the repository. Uh, it's hard to see here. It's, it's not expanding, but this is actually a, a PDF version. Uh, if you click on this, it's a, it's a PDF, but you can download the uh, a zipped uh, directory here by, by clicking on this, this link. Um, so again, as far as questions go, please don't be shy. Um, if you have a question, I'm sure there's others who have the same question as well. Um, so please ask your question and, and um, we'll try to answer that. 
Um, if I am going too fast or if the font is too small or any other kind of general comments, um, there is a chat um, feed in AirMeet. So feel free to post kind of um, things there as well and save the questions kind of for that Q&A tab. Um, I think you can like upvote questions in the, in the Q&A as well. So um, the final thing, there is a um, Slack channel specifically for this tutorial. Um, we have a lot of concepts to get through in the slides. So if there's things that I don't particularly cover that are in the material, or if you have follow-up questions, that's what the Slack channel is for. I'll be monitoring that um, throughout the week. So if you have questions after the tutorial, you can post them in Slack. I'd like to keep the questions during the live tutorial in AirMeet. So again, if you have questions, please post them in, um, in AirMeet. Um, so that's as far as, let's see, any other housekeeping items? Oh, one last thing. I'm going to try to give some breaks throughout this tutorial. Uh, we're together from two to six central. So I like to try to have two shorter, like five minute breaks and then a longer 20 minute break about halfway through. So I'm gonna shoot for having a five minute break around three central a longer 20 minute break around four central about halfway through, and then another five minute break um, around five central. Um, so I believe that's everything in terms of housekeeping. Eric, uh, was there anything that you wanted to add or any other kind of housekeeping items that you can think of before we kind of get started? No, I think we're good to go. Um, Carmen was asking if we could get a little time for getting things set up. So you might want to give people a, a couple of minutes just to, to get ready to go. Okay. Yeah, we'll do um, just a few minutes here to kind of get things um, set up. Again, that repository um, link, I'll put it back in the, the chat here. You can download, there's a zip. Um, so this is what it'll look like when you land. Maybe I'll zoom out. Maybe I'll make this big. This is what the repository will the repository looks like. If you scroll down a little bit, again, there's a binder button that you can push here to launch binder. And the course material, if you you can download it via via zip. I'm not um, sharing my screen for yeah. some reason. It kicked me out. Yep. So it says my screen is still loading here. Not sure. Try refreshing your browser. And I believe Logan will be back shortly. Am I back? <laughs> you are back. Um, we don't see you yet, but your voice is back. Okay. <laughs> there we go. There's your screen, and we still just see your initials. Is your camera off? Test, test. <laughs> yep, there you are. Okay, sorry, everyone. Technical difficulties. <laughs> so this is what the repository will look like. If you scroll down, there's a binder button here where you can launch binder. And there is a um, link here where you can download a zipped version as well. I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be using IPython um, for the, most of the tutorial for the live coding session, but you can also um, use Jupyter a, a notebook and put in your own commands there if you'd like. You can also, um, if you launch Binder, so it's gonna look something like this when you launch Binder. This is different. But you have this new command here. If you do uh, Python 3, that'll open up a new Jupyter notebook and you can type along with me to actually have it in a notebook. Or you can use a terminal and what that'll do is drop you into a terminal. You can type IPython and follow along with me as well. So you can do that um, 
as well if you'd like. Um, but before we get started in the actual slides, uh, I want to give a background or a motivation for why we should be using NumPy. Um, it's an extremely useful tool, especially for numerical computing. Um, I'm going to use these first kind of five minutes um, as a demonstration of why we should be using NumPy. If this seems fast to you, don't worry. We're going to cover everything that I type and go over in the terminal in detail later on. For the next five minutes, focus on the concepts of what I'm showing. So this is kind of a um, chicken before egg where I want to explain why we should be using NumPy, but I have to write NumPy, some stuff in NumPy in order to show that. So bear with me for a little bit, focus on the concepts here rather than the actual NumPy array kind of manipulation. We'll be covering all that later on in detail. So, um, like I said, most of the tutorial, we're gonna be using an IPython um, session. If you have your Python virtual environment set up the way we had um, from the instructions on the GitHub repo, you should be able to drop into that NumPy tutorial. Tutorial. Um, using the conda activate NumPy tutorial command. And then we're gonna just open IPython and IPython session by just typing IPython. So that's gonna drop us into um, an IPython show. Um, so again, I wanna start with some concepts to just demonstrate kind of why we are um, using NumPy, why it's important. Um, let me get, yeah, so we're gonna start with some, some, some um, demonstrations of NumPy, essentially. So we're gonna let's say we have just a vanilla list in Python, two lists, we're gonna call one A and one B. In a, in a world kind of without NumPy, um, if we wanted to add these two lists together, we would hope that we could type A plus B and we'd get kind of the addition of both of these lists together in an LMI, element-wise fashion. But in Python, just vanilla Python, we don't get what we ex expect as far as a computation addition element-wise, this is actually a concatenation, where these two lists are being um, concatenated together, not added in an element-by-element element, um, way. So this isn't kind of the intended effect, it's a concatenation rather than a computation. So if we wanted to add these two lists together, we'd have to write some type of for loop to be able to say, grab the first element of A, add it to the first element of B. Do the same thing with the second element of A and the second element of B. Um, so we'd have to do something like we'd say result is equal to an empty list. We'd say for you know value for value in A and value in B, we'd have to take the um, sum add them together. We're essentially, we're saying zip is just a function that's gonna, it's like a zipper, it's zipping these two things together and it's saying for the value in A and the value in B, you're gonna add those two together and pend it to the result. So we're getting one plus two is three, two plus four is six, three plus six is nine and so on. If we didn't have NumPy and all we had was just vanilla lists, we'd have to do something like this for loop where we're iterating over each item and adding them um, together. So this loop isn't that complicated, it's not that complex, but it can be um, annoying if you, know, you have a bunch of data or you have multi-dimensional arrays where now you have to kind of do two or three levels of this for loop in order to get your expected um, value. 
uh, as, a, as a result of, of adding those together in an element wise fashion. Zip here is a built-in Python function. Again, it's used to kind of combine two objects together. You can think of it as like a zipper where a zipper takes two um, sides of a jacket together and zips them together. So that's the idea of what zip does here. This isn't a NumPy thing, this is a Python thing. It's just for um, sake of example here where we're saying if we didn't have NumPy, we'd have to do this kind of for loop with a zip. But this idea, this concept is where NumPy comes in. And um, just as, a, as an aside, it's a Python convention that we usually import NumPy as NP. It's a convention where we're saying it's an alias. NP is an alias for NumPy. We're saying import the library NumPy as NP. So anytime we use a NumPy function or anytime you see NP, uh, you should think NumPy. So essentially, rather than typing out NumPy every time, we can do just an NP. Um, but this is where NumPy comes in. Instead of having kind of these two lists, we can have NumPy A, which is a NumPy array. And we'll say one, two, three, four, five. And we'll say that list B as a NumPy array. Two, four, six, eight, 10. Now, if I do NP A plus NP B, Whoops. I can see that that element by element addition is what I was expecting, what I wanted is um, delivered by NumPy because I have those two NumPy arrays. So we're gonna cover this in more detail later on, um, but for now the key point is, you know, NumPy handles this element by element, um, element su uh, summation or calculation for us. We don't need to write a for loop. Um, in order to do this. And when we're working with NumPy and our data in NumPy arrays, we rarely have to use those for loops when um, doing calculations on arrays. So these uh, NumPy arrays are specialized data structures. Uh, it means we don't, uh, we not only get the benefits of an efficient kind of in-memory representation, but also efficient specialized um, implementations as well. Um, so for these types of kind of element by element calculations here, NumPy is doing something, something um, behind the scenes called vectorization or a, a vector operation where a for loop is occurring, but it's occurring in the background. And NumPy is pushing that for loop down into uh, C code actually and handling it for us in, in the in the back end. So it's kind of abstracting away that need to write that for loop so we don't we don't have to. So many NumPy operations are implemented in C. Um, it it avoids kind of the, the cost of having to do a, a vanilla for loop in uh, in uh, in just normal Python. Um, so when we use NumPy and the NumPy array data structure, we get kind of a behind the scenes optimization um, where NumPy can kind of utilize that, that pre-compiled C code for us. So NumPy is fast because of this operations, uh, this type of vectorized operation, um, but it's also efficient in terms of memory and um, data storage. So these um, arrays have something called a D type or a data type. So I look at this uh, NP, so my NPA, this is my array. If I look at NP.dtype, oops, NP underscore A dot D type. This is a data type and it's it says int 64, which stands for integer and 64 is uh, 64 bits. So what this is doing is enforcing a NumPy array has a specific data type and it enforces all the elements in that array or in that data structure to be of the same type. So every element that is stored in the array is of that type. Um, there are integers, there are floats. We even have things called unsigned integers. Um, and we'll see this later on. Um, but if we had our our integer, our, our NP underscore A array is set to take integers. If we tried to set one element in here as a floating point value, 
this will actually be truncated, even though this is a float, this will be truncated and stored, just the integer will be stored in the array. Um, can you guys still hear me? It said my internet was interrupted. Okay, sorry about all this. I should, am I sharing my screen still? Sorry, everyone. Okay, so again, our NumPy arrays have a data type. This enforces that every element in that array has to be of that data type. What that means is if we try to sometimes set items of our array with different data types, like for instance, here we have a float my NPA array has to be integers. So this is getting truncated and just the integer portion is being um, retained in that array. Again, we're gonna go over this in more detail. The point here is NumPy arrays are fast and NumPy arrays are type safe, which means they, they're um, uh, homogeneous, homogeneous. Everything has to be of the same type. Um, NumPy also has something called universal functions or ufuncs. So universal functions or ufuncs for short, whoops, <laughs> ufuncs for short. Um, these are basically mathematical functions that um, are optimized to work on NumPy arrays in that element by element fashion in the kind of vectorized sense that I said before. So NumPy, or remember NP as an alias, has something called a sine function, where we can take the sine of everything of an array. Uh, you have things like the cosine function, you have cosine, right? These are universal functions that are designed and optimized to work on um, NumPy arrays. And um, one additional thing is this NumPy. So if I look at the, remember Python has a type. If I look at NP underscore A, this is an ND array. It's a NumPy ND array. ND stands for n-dimensional, so multi-dimensions. So these arrays don't just have to be one dimension. Um, they can be multiple dimensions as well. And NumPy gives us a way to easily reference um, locations in that multi-dimensional space much easier than with a list. Uh, if I had um, something like an array where I had um, uh, let's say I have a nested list one, two, three, four, five, six, This is my A array. I have two rows and three columns. If I wanted to grab this five here, and again, we'll go over this, but if I wanted to grab this five, I could say one comma one, which is a location given the indices of my array. If I had a list that looked like this, I couldn't do one comma one. That syntax does not work with a list. I'd have to type out L1 to get that first row and then L1 again to grab that one, um, zero, one uh, element there. So remember Python is zero index. The indexing start at zero. Um, so NumPy, the point here, again, we're gonna go over this when we talk about indexing and slicing, but the point here is that NumPy gives us a way to deal with multi-dimensions much easier than if we just stored things in kind of vanilla Python lists. So just to kind of conclude this opening statement, if you will, um, we should really reach for NumPy for a few different reasons. One is because of speed. NumPy arrays are specialized data structures. Um, they push things down to C and even Fortran code for us. Um, and you know, sometimes NumPy arrays can be even 100 times faster than just vanilla Python lists in terms of processing um, because of those kind of vectorized operations. Um, the second thing is we have a forced or an enforced data type. 
um, everything will be the same. We, in those arrays, they have to be of the same type. Um, so we call that type safe. Uh, another reason, the third kind of reason is we have these universal functions that are optimized to, to work on NumPy arrays, um, which is really nice and convenient for us. And lastly, we kind of get that easy handling of multi dimensional space with NumPy. So for these reasons, um, we'll tend to see a lot of scientific software using NumPy um, for their data analysis. I'm sorry, everyone. My internet keeps dropping my screen for you. It's not intentional. Um, Logan, so we're going to start going through. Yes. Um, in the bottom right of your screen, there's by the record button, there's a little icon that says HD. Thank you. You see that? Yep. Change that just to change LD. It to, yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to jump into the slides here. We're going to start here on slide five. So if you're following along with the slides, I'm going to live code this. So if you're following along, it'd be good to have the um, PDF up so you can follow, but I'm going to live code some of these slides and then I'll be coming back to some of the slides that have pretty good visualization um, as needed. Um, there's some some slides that have good visuals that I, I want to make sure, sure we use, but for the time being, I'm going to use um, the IPython kind of session to, to go through some of this. So we've covered some of the benefits of NumPy. We're going to dive into kind of how to use them. Uh, we can create or initialize array. Typically, we do this by using a, a list. So here, if I type NumPy array, and I provide it a list of 0, 1, 2, 3, this will return an array. So I'm calling np.array, that function in NumPy, and I'm providing a list of 0, 1, 2, 3. So that will return my array. We can also use a something called like a generator or a generative function with NumPy if we want. So we can use array and if you're familiar with the range object in Python, range five, that works as well. We'll cover a specific NumPy function that will do this for us. But the idea here is you can pass not just a list in here, you can pass a list or, or some type of generative function within here to return a NumPy array as well. So we can create an array um, using um, the np.array function. Um, what's nice about this is in IPython, Um, when we, we show this array, um, it'll come back and tell us that's an actual array. If we print this array, it'll print it so it looks um, kind of like a list for us. But the important thing to remember here is that this is actually an array. It is not um, a list. When we have an array, there are certain attributes attached to that array. One of them we covered already, which is the data type or D type. In this case, we've um, shown that this is a integer. We've shown that a dot D type will return that D type for us. It'll tell us what it is. Um, this is an integer, 64, which means 64 bits integers is what's stored in our array. If you're on Windows, this is going to default to 32. I think Mac and Linux, it defaults to 64. Um, but that's just the, um, the default for, for the platform or for the system. If we wanted to change the data type of an array, we can. there's a few different ways we can do that. One is when we set up this array, we can pass the D type keyword argument here. 
And when we do that, this is going to instantiate this array using that data type that we provide here. Okay, I'm going to slow down a little bit. So again, we have attributes attached to our array. One of those attributes is the D type, which stands for data type. When we initialize our array, we can provide the D type here to specify a specific data type. Another way we can do that, I have my A array here. The data type is an integer 32. I can say A dot as type, and I can pass a different data type here. I call this B. Now, if I look at B, I apologize, everyone. I'm trying to keep my, my screen up for you. So we can specify the data type upon an initialization with the D type argument, or we can take an array that already exists and use the as type to cast it to a different type. Okay. So two ways we can um, define the data type for our array. Not only do we have a data type attribute, we also have something called ndim for number of dimensions. In this case, if we look at our A array, it's only got uh, one kind of row of, of information, so our dimension is one. If I said my array was kind of a list of lists, a list of lists or a nested list. This is what my array looks like. If I look at my dimensions now, I have two. So I have rows and I have columns in this case. So my dimensions are two. The shape is another attribute that's helpful in NumPy. And this will tell us the um, kind of a length of each dimension. So here I have two rows and I have three columns. So my shape is two by three. I also have something called the item size, which will essentially give me how many cells are in that array or, um, well, that's, I'm sorry. That's item size. Size, <laughs> we have shape and we have size. Size is the number of cells in that array or the number of elements. And it's just the um, product of the shape because we have one, two, three, four, five, six elements in this array A. My A array is a, my, it's a 64-bit integer. There are um, eight bits equals one byte. So if this is 64-bit integer, that means there's eight bytes. In a 64-bit integer. So my A, item size is eight. This is telling me the size in bytes for a single element. So each of these elements is a 64 bit or eight byte element. So because I have, because I have six of them, I have six elements. Each of them are eight bytes. My number of bytes is, is 48 here. Okay, so just an example of some of the attributes that we have that are attached to these arrays, okay?
if we go to slide um, six, we can start showing some of the mathematical functions that we can do with these arrays. So if I have an array, one, two, three, four, I have a B array of two, three, four, and five. We showed this in kind of the opening, but I can say A plus B, and that will give me an element by element wise summation without doing a for loop, right? I can also do A times B, which will give me one times two, two which is two, two times three, which is six, three times four, which is 12, and on down the line. I can also do a raise A to the power of B, do all these different things with our arrays, NumPy kind of handles that element by element vectorization for us. I apologize that my screen keeps going in and out. Okay. NumPy has a, so before I showed that we can create an array using this built-in range function with Python. NumPy actually gives us a way to do this calling a range, which is the same thing, and this stands for array range. So it's the same thing as range in Python, but this is gonna give us a um, an array in return. So instead of doing np dot array and then calling range, we can use kind of a shorthand for a range, and that'll give us a range of numbers. As you can see on the slide here, x is np dot a range eleven dot zero on slide six. If we look at this, the data type is a float, so a floating point number. And that's because np.arrange is gonna infer your data type based off of the um, number that you provide it here. If we said C was np.arrange 11 and provided an integer, we can see that C dot, our C D type is an integer. So notice here that we have kind of a trailing dot or a trailing decimal or a trailing period that gives us a hint that, hey, these are actually floating point values. Whereas if we provide just an 11 um, with no dot zero or no dot, uh, we don't see trailing zeros here and, and it's gonna be returned as an integer. So a helpful, a helpful command is our np dot range. We have our x. So we not only can add and multiply two NumPy arrays together, we can also use a constant. So if I wanted to multiply all this by five, I could just do a multiply multiplication by five and that will element by element um, multiply all those elements in my X array by five, okay? NumPy also has some um, built-in constants. So there's an np.py, np, dot e as well. So here on the slide, slide six, we're saying c is gonna be two times np dot pi divided by 10. What this is gonna do is take our constant, I'm sorry, that's c, not x. We're gonna create a, wow. <laughs> we're gonna create a constant c, which is gonna take pi, multiply it by two and divide by 10. So this is our constant C. X, which I should have kept, is gonna be my np dot array of 11. So now I can say C times X. And I can see that I can manipulate and multiply and do things together. There is a way to do these operations in place. So if I wanted to save this array as my X, I could do X is equal to C times X. 
and that would give me um, that multiplication. Or what we could do is we could use um, kind of a Python shorthand for this and say x times equal to c. And that is the same as saying x is equal to c times x. These two things are equivalent. Okay. So again, we're on, if you're following along with our slides, we're right here on slide six. I'm kind of live coding them so that you can see me step through them. And if you have questions, I can answer them. Um, but we're trying to um, kind of go through these slides um, live code rather than um, kind of just show you a PowerPoint and, and walk through it. So again, we can have our X, our X array. And again, I said there's universal functions that we can use to kind of pick the sign of those things as well. Okay. We're going to continue on to slide seven. So not only can we grab not only can we grab certain things, I'm sorry, not only can we kind of create these functions, we can grab certain elements from them. So if we have this array, X, right, and I created this as numpy.arrange11. I have this array X. I can index or grab an item from it by using the square bracket notation. So here, this is saying, give me the first element of X. Remember, Python is zero indexed. Okay. So if I create a simple array here, where I'm going to say my array is zero, one, two, and three, just to follow along in the slides, this is the same array that's in the slide. If I say A of zero, I get zero. Not only can I grab elements, I can also set elements with this indexing as well. So if I say A of zero is 10, that's gonna say in the first location of this array, set it to the value 10. I get a 10 here, okay? One thing, one word of caution is if you remember, our A array has a specific data type. And it's an integer 64 in this case. That's the way it's been initialized, which means everything in this, ray, in this array needs to be of type integer, a 64-bit integer. If I try to set that first item as a float value, so again, oops, 10.6 is a float. If I try to set that first item as a float, NumPy is going to truncate and only keep that first um, integer portion of that integer or of that of that float. Notice that this is a truncation and not a round. Okay, so this is this is coercion, type coercion. Again, NumPy is what we're saying is type safe. Everything in that element need everything in that array, all the elements in that array need to be of the same type. So that's why this gets truncated because we've initially set up our array to be to hold integers. Now what I could have done is I could have created this array and said, I know that this eventually is going to hold floating point values. So now when I set this to 10.6, now this will actually be retained as a float because I have set this up as a floating point, this array to contain floating point values. Okay. So be careful if you have an array set up to hold integers and you're trying to set values as floating points, 
um, they're going to get coerced into being integers. Okay. Another um, useful command that uh, might be helpful is if we have, well, it's not, in this case, it's more of to, to demonstrate a point on slide seven is if we have an array that's set up to hold integers, Okay, so we have this array. The data type of this array is int64. There's something called a.fill, which will fill this array with certain values. If I wanna fill it with five, that's great. If I wanna fill it with negative 4.8, for example, this is only gonna return negative four because again, my array is set up to contain integers. Okay. So something to be aware of is that if you're trying to fill or you're trying to set certain values of an array that has a certain data type, you might get some unexpected um, behavior. But again, this is because uh, NumPy array has to have a certain type for, for its elements. So I'm going to move to slide eight. Slide eight has um, some good visuals that I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna draw on here. So um, let me know if I need to zoom in or if you cannot see my screen. But we're gonna talk about multi-dimensions with NumPy arrays. Kind of covered the, the 1D case, but in slide eight here, uh, we start to show the 2D case. Um, so in this example, we've set up this array here using NumPy. And we can see we have kind of this um, visual representation of this array based on the code that we put, put into kind of like an IPython session or, or um, our terminal or a Python interpreter. When we print A, it's gonna try to nicely align kind of our, our columns for us and our uh, our rows, as you can see, kind of here. But when we talk about the shape of this array, again, we have different dimensions. So we have two dimensions of this array. We have rows and we have columns. And the number of rows is gonna appear in the first index or the first uh, dimension of our shape tuple. And the number of columns is gonna appear in the second dimension or the um, second place of that shape tuple. So what this is saying is this is our first dimension, dimension zero going down. We have two of them, two rows. Our dimension zero, which corresponds to this right here, four, is saying that we have four columns, okay? Again, in the two-dimensional space, when we say size, that's the product of our shape. So we have um, eight kind of slots or cells here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's what that size represents. And again, our n dim is saying that we have two dimensions, dimension zero and dimension one. Remember, Python is zero indexed. So in this case, we have two dimensions, but we start counting at zero. So that's why that's called dimension zero. We have dimension zero and dimension one to represent two dimensions. Python is, is zero index. So things start at, at, at zero when we start counting. In the previous kind of in the terminal, I said we had an array and I was using the square brackets to say like, give me element zero here, a square bracket and a zero. When we have two dimensions, we can index or um, try to find coordinates in that array using the same syntax, but we provide a number for each of the dimensions we have. And that's what's going on here where we're saying, the first thing that I'm gonna provide is a one to specify that I want the row here, zero, one, this row. 
And then I specify a second number corresponding to my dimension one here. I'm saying I want the third column. So I'm going to go over zero, one, two, three. So that intersection of the column at index one, I'm sorry, the row at index one and the column at index three is this negative one here. So that's what's going on when we try to index these multi-dimensional arrays is we can use the square bracket rotation or the square bracket notation. And we're saying this corresponds to row, this corresponds to column, and this is pulling out my negative one, which would give me, or setting my negative one, which would put a negative one in there. Okay. If we don't specify a comma here, and we're just saying A1, as we see in this case right here, what this is gonna do is just give us the entire row Apologize. So this is going to give us the entire row. Okay, A1 is just going to give us the entire row here. If we said A0, that would have given us this first row here. Okay. So I apologize, I know my screen's going in and out. Um, Eric, are there any questions so far based on kind of this um, indexing section? Um, so far I've been keeping up with a lot of them in the chat, so I think you're good to go. Okay, thanks. Uh, here came in one, can you select, select a column or range? Yes, so you can absolutely select a column or a range and that's where we're getting to next. Um, so this idea of selecting one item from a one dimensional array or one item from a two dimensional or multi-dimensional array is called indexing. It's really like one point. But if you wanted a range of items, we um, call this slicing or getting a slice of an array. And that's what we're gonna cover next. So we talk about indexing and we're talking about slicing, but if we wanted kind of more than just one element in a pinpoint kind of fashion and we want like a range, we can do that through slicing. When we have slicing, the notation is to have a uh, lower, an upper, and a step size separated by these colons, okay? So, if we have on this slide, slide 10, if we set up an array, just a one dimensional array to have 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 as the elements, we have an index in Python that starts at zero, counting from the left, the item at the zero if index is 10, one is 11, two is 12, three is 13 and four is 14. We can slice this array to say um, up to, but not including, let's say that we wanted 11 and 12 out of this array A. We would specify the lower bound being one and the upper bound being three. And that's because mathematically, when we define slices, our lower bound is inclusive and our upper bound is exclusive. So the way you can think about this is up to, but not including. So this says, give me the array A, the slice of array A, starting at index one, going up to, but not including index three. Whoops. So what that would do is it would say, start at index one, go up two, but don't include index three, which would give me this 11 and 12. Now in Python, this isn't a NumPy thing, this is a Python thing. We also have negative indexing. 
and that's counting from the back, so from right to left, and that starts at negative one. But it's the same idea, this up to but not including, if I wanted to say start at index one, go up to but don't include index negative two, that would be the same numbers 11 and 12. It works the same way if you want to start with a negative indice here. So here we use the negative two on the back end. Um, on, we can use it on the, the front as well. And we say we want to start at negative four. We want to start at negative four and we want to go up to, but not including index three. That's that same 11 and 12. So all of these on this slide here are going to give us the same answer. Uh, there are different ways of indexing our array. Now, just kind of um, a, uh, a concept here that isn't necessarily NumPy specific, but when you use these negative indices, they can, um, they can uh, communicate something to different people in the sense of when I see negative two, that to me tells me the up to but not including the last two elements, right? Like if I said A negative one, that would say, give me the last item of my array. So you can use negative indexing and it might help um, uh, other people understand really what you're trying to portray in your code. <laughs> so just, just an idea here that if you use negative indexing, it might be helpful um, if you don't know the total size of your array, but you know you wanna leave off the last two or you know you wanna grab the last item or the last two items if it's some type of maybe like priority queue or the way things are coming in. So we can use slicing and we can use negative indexes with those, those slicing um, as well. Okay. One other thing that we can do is we can omit um, the kind of start or stop depending on um, what we're trying to do with our slices. Again, what we can see here is that if we have an array, we can go from lower to upper and include a step size. If we don't include the lower bound, this is assuming that you want to start at the beginning. And if we don't include the upper bound, it's going to assume that you want to go towards the end of the array. And if you don't include the step, the default is um, just a step size of one. So what that allows us to do is say, if I want to go up to, for example, we have this array A, and I want to go up to, um, but not include three, that's going to give me 10, 11, and 12 here, which is the same thing as saying A, 0, colon, 3. I don't have to include this 0 here because NumPy is going to assume that if you don't specify it, it's going to be a 0. Similarly, if I don't include that upper bound, it's going to um, assume that I want to go to the end of the array. So in this case here, what it's saying is start at negative two and just go to the end. So this would be the same as saying going from negative two to five, essentially, because you're saying up to but not including the end of that array. The step size is like a stride where if we wanted to skip elements, we can provide a step size here of two. And the reason that this gives us 10, 14, uh, 10, 12, 14 is really what this is doing behind the scenes is saying zero to five by two. So it's saying start at zero, up to but not including five and skip every other. And that's why we're getting that 10, 12, 14. Okay. 
So in this case, this is the start. So we're starting at negative two and we're going on to the end. Okay. So slide 11, we have a way to um, see visually the code uh, in addition to the slices here, okay? So I'm gonna take a, a five minute break here um, just to kind of let you stare at this for a second. Um, we'll come back after, after five minutes and um, and I'll cover exactly what's going what's going on here. Okay, so I like to try to build in a few um, short breaks. So we're gonna do um, a break right now. You should be good to go, Logan. Thanks, Eric. Okay, so we're gonna um, keep moving forward with our array slicing. So I'm gonna draw on this screen, on this slide, we're on slide 11, and then I'm gonna go into the terminal and I'll, I'll demo this um, live. So again, this slide is color coded. So the orange portion uh, corresponds to the orange blocks. The blue portion corresponds to the blue, the red to the red, and kind of this darker blue corresponds to these kind of darker blue squares um, over here. So what's happening here is our orange, we're saying we want our zeroth row. So again, Python is zero indexed. So this zero, corresponds with this zero here. And then what we're saying is we want three to five. So the columns three up to, but not including five. So I'm gonna start with three. I'm gonna go up to, but I'm not gonna include the fifth column. And that's what gives me the, that three and that four in orange there. Okay, so again, the zero column and the three up to, but not including, and that's what gives me this three and this four here. This lighter blue section corresponds to the lower right of our array, this two dimensional array. And what we're saying here is I want to start at row four and I wanna go on to the end of the array. And I wanna start at column four and go on to the end of the array. And that intersection is what gives us the lower right-hand portion on this, um, of this two-dimensional array. So remember, we can leave out or omit the last kind of piece of our slice that corresponds to, um, if we don't provide the upper index, the upper bound, it's gonna assume that you wanna go to the end. So that's what's happening here is we're saying start at row four, go to the end, start at column four, go to the end, and that intersection gives us that, that block in the lower right-hand corner, okay? We also have the ability to take a single column, which I believe was the um, question earlier. If we have this two-dimensional array, this lonely colon in the, the row dimension, dimension zero, tells me, oh, I wanna take all the rows of my original array, but only the second column. And that's what's happening here. So this colon is notation to say, give me all of a certain dimension. In this case, we are looking at um, everything in the row dimension and just the second column, which is why we get to 12, 22 and on. The strided example is a little bit harder. Um, 
basically what we're saying here is we want to start at our row two. That's this two right here. And I want to go every other row. So that gives me this row here. So this two and then every other row gives me two and four. And then for my columns, I want to, I have colon, colon two, which tells me go from the start to the end, but skip every other two. So that's telling me that I want to skip one, skip one, skip one. And that intersection is what gives me these darker blue boxes. So that's how um, we can use kind of a mixture of uh, upper bounds, lower bounds, strides, the ability to kind of look at a multi-dimensional array and grab a certain item or specific items based off of kind of those, those slices. So just to kind of um, demonstrate this in the terminal, I clear my screen and I'm going to um, create this array. And I'm going to say, let's see, np.arrange six plus, um, what I want to do here, 60 step. So um, this is the array that appears on the slide. Again, if I just want the first row of this array, I can specify a zero and that would give me zero, one, two, three, four, five. If I want the first row, but only what's in orange, that three and that four, I'm specifying three up to, but not including. So I wanna go zero, one, two, three, up to, but not including that five, which would give me this three and this four. So that's what's in orange of that array, okay? If I look at the lighter blue, this will give me zero, one, two, three, four and on. So my two rows here, but I don't want both of those rows in all the columns. I just want the last two columns here. So I can specify zero, one, two, three, fourth column and on, which is what we're doing here. So this gives me the fourth row and on and the fourth column and on, which gives me that lower um, two by two quadrant, okay? And again, if I want all of my rows, but only the second column, that's what I can do with a colon comma two. That's how I get what's in red. If we're doing this type of kind of skipping, usually what I'll do is I'll say, What's the size of my array? If it's gonna be two by two, my what array do I want returned? If I want something um, that I know is gonna be multidimensional, that means I have to have a comma. So I'll build my kind of indexing with a comma to start. And then I'll say, okay, where do I want to start this slice? I wanna start this slice at row two, and then I wanna go on. So let's, I, I know I wanna go to and on. And if I want to skip or I have some type of step that tells me that I'd have to have some type of step. So I'm gonna do two colons here in order to say, I know I wanna go to and on, and I wanna skip. So what I can do is just take a look and see what that looks like. That gives me my correct rows, but now I need to get my correct columns. So what I would do in that case is I'd say, what columns do I wanna start at? Well, I wanna start at zero, so that's fine. And then I wanna go all the way to the end, but I wanna skip by two. So it would look something like this which is what gives me my um, result there. But remember, I don't have to specify the zero and I can just use um, the double colon and a two. Okay. 
So this is how we can kind of slice using the, the colon and commas to specify certain dimensions. When we slice our array, so I'm on slide 12, I'm gonna create a simple, a simple array here. Zero, one, two, three, four. Okay. Not only can we use slices to reference um, elements in our array, we can also use slices to set elements in our array. So again, if I say I want to, I want to set the last two items of my array to some number, maybe ninety-nine. I can say those last two items are going to be this constant value and NumPy is going to fill those in for me. Okay. I can also specify a list of the same size. And that slice will get filled in based on what I provide. I can't provide a slice that's a different size. I can't provide something to fill in for my size that's a different size. So I'd need to say um, this would need to be the same kind of size. Okay. So we can use slicing to pull elements out of an array. We can also use slices to set elements of an array. So we have kind of our first exercise here that I'd like you to do. You can copy and paste this code into your um, either Jupyter Notebook or IPython session. What this is gonna do is create your integers from zero to 25, and then it's gonna reshape it so that the array is a two-dimensional array, five by five, and it will mimic what you see on the screen here. Um, so the idea with this slide is to try to extract the yellow, try to extract the red, and then try to extract the blue, okay? So I'm gonna give you about five minutes to do this exercise, um, and then I will kind of explain it and, and walk through it. So take five minutes and do this exercise, and then I will um, live code it along with you.
We're going to take about two more minutes and then we'll come together maybe about one more minute <laughs> since my timer just ticked. So about one more minute and uh, we'll go over the Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and go over this together. So I'm gonna say A is my range to 25. If I look at A, again, this arrange function is gonna give me the integers from zero to 24. And if I wanna reshape this, This is gonna take that array, that one dimensional array, and now make it two dimensional so that they, I'm kind of five by, a five by five array, okay? So we're gonna start with um, the yellow slice, which is kind of that last row in our array. So there's a number of ways I could do this. If I know that my array is five by five or has five rows, what I could do is I could say something like this which would give me the row at zero, one, two, three, four, which is my last row. You could have also done something like this to communicate that this array is multi-dimensional, right? If you just saw this and you didn't know A was 2D, A could have been you know, 1D and you only got one element out of this. Um, but kind of including that lonely colon <laughs> will um, kind of communicate that you have a multi-dimensional array. But another way you could have done this is using negative indexing. So you could have done the same thing here. All four of these answers are the same. Um, it's a matter of preference or what you're trying to communicate. So our, our yellow is you know, any of these things um, here. Okay. So for red, what I usually like to do is I say, okay, my red is going to be two dimensional. So I know I'm going to have a comma here. Okay. Do I need to index my rows is a question that I usually ask myself. I say no. So what I'm going to do is have that colon here. It's going to say, I want all of my rows. I don't need to kind of index my rows. So I want all of them. And then I'm gonna say, as far as my columns go, I know that I need some type of step size because I'm skipping. So what I can do is just put in here a double colon and a two and see what that looks like. If I look at this compared to my original A array, I'll say, okay, it looks like I'm getting all of my columns, which is what I want, but my step size is off. What I really want is this, this column here. <laughs> with the 1, 6, 11, 16, and this column with the 3, 8, 13, 18. So what's happening there is I'm actually starting at index zero. So what I wanna do is start at index one. So if I put a one here, this will give me my columns, every other column starting at the column index one, going every other. So my red would be this. Finally, um, if we look at blue, again, I usually set this up the same way where I say, okay, I know my blue is gonna be kind of a two dimensional piece of this array. Do I want to index my rows? The answer is yes, um, because I'm starting at row one and I need to kind of skip every other one. 
if I do start at row index one, skip every other one, let's see what that looks like. Okay, my rows look good. I'm getting the row that starts with five and the row that starts with 15. But now what I need to do is um, skip for my columns. And I know that my column, I wanna start at zero and go every other. So I can just do a um, step here and that will give me my five, seven, nine, 15, 17, 19. But then I look and I say, oh, well, I actually don't want the last, um, I don't want the last column here. So how can I kind of do that? I can say, well, I want this to go um, up to, but not including my index at three. Okay, so I say, I wanna start my column at zero. I wanna go up to, but not include index three. And I wanna skip every other column. And that's what my blue would represent. So blue here. Okay. So again, yellow for my solution, I have A, negative one, um, or this. Maybe I'll do it a comment. Red, I have A, colon, one, two. And blue, I have A, one, two. Uh, three, two. Okay. How do we do on this exercise? Do we do good? Do we do bad? Okay. Awesome. Wonderful. So one thing to note, I'm, I'm moving on to slide 14 now. So we talked about how NumPy is, is efficient. Um, arrays created by slicing um, actually share their data with the originating array. So changing values in a slice actually also will change values in the original array. And this is something that you need to be aware of, uh, which might not be um, expected <laughs> at first. So by way of an example, if I have a simple array here, Apologize again, but if I have a simple array here, so this is what my A array looks like. If I create a slice of this data for B, okay, my B values are two and three. If I assign that first value of B to be 10, if I look at my A array, it was also changed. Changing B changes A because this is, slices are what we call a view into the original array. So no memory is copied when we create a slice. It's viewing that original kind of data buffer, um, which will, which means if we change the slice, we will change the original array that we referenced. So changing B will change A. And the way you can kind of check for this, well, the first thing you can do is remember, anytime you slice, you're creating a view, not a copy. And you can check for this if you want to with this shares uh, memory command. We see that A and B both share memory. Okay, if we wanted to, we could say that A, that B was a copy of A. So we have A, well, let me start over. <laughs> let me recreate A. We say A is this, and we say B is a copy of A and we go and assign 10 to that first element of B. If we look at A now, because we have copied that, A is not changed, okay? So this is um, 
can be expensive if you have a lot of data and you don't want to be creating multiple data copies. So NumPy is efficient in the sense where if you're using a slice, it's not going to create copies. It's going to use the same kind of data buffer. But if you're assigning values on a slice of data, it's going to change the original data um, unless you, you do a copy or something like this. So it's something to be aware of. Um, but you have to uh, test, test. Can you hear me? This is something to be aware of. Okay. This is something to be aware of in the sense that um, whenever you create a slice, you could be changing the original um, data. So I'm gonna go back to our slides here. I'm on slide 15. Actually, um, we are gonna do a, we're gonna do an exercise. So if you are using um, we're going to do the calc return exercise. So if you are using binder, you should be able to navigate to that exercise. So if you've clicked binder, you should see in exercises, there's a calc return. If you want to follow along here, you can use the calc return .ipynb as the notebook. If you want to do it as just a standalone Python file .py, you can do that as well. Both of these have solutions. Um, if you get stuck, you can use them. But I am going to um, log my history real quick. <laughs> Oh man. Um, uh, give me what's the history. Yes. Okay. I am going to navigate to <laughs> my um, repository here. I apologize. Um, if you're in the repository because you've cloned it, or if you're in Binder, I'm I'm just going to launch a Jupyter notebook. Can't do this. I'm gonna make sure that I'm in my um, directory for the class and I'm gonna launch a Jupyter Notebook. If you're in Binder, you should see something that looks something like this, um, but you should click on exercises and then calc return. And we're gonna to go to the uh, calc return.ipynb notebook. Again, if you wanna use a .py, you can do that um, the, the Python file, you can do that as well. But we have this um, exercise that I'd like you to do. Um, we have some data for the Apple stock for business days in 2008. We have it stored as a CSV file and we're gonna use a Python or a NumPy command called load text to get that into an array. We're gonna cover this later on. So for right now, this is just some boilerplate code um, for you. But essentially what we wanna do is create a, um, an array that holds the return. And the return is um, calculated by the timestamp, um, kind of the day after or the timestamp that you're on, um, minus the day before divided by kind of that, that day before. Um, so we're gonna use this formula and NumPy to um, solve this problem essentially. 
If we run this notebook, again, we have some boilerplate here for you to um, load these prices. But what we want to do is using NumPy, not a for loop. We're not going to write a for loop to say um, grab the day before and do subtraction and division. We have to use NumPy and arrays. What we want to do is calculate that difference and divide by kind of the days before. Um, so you're you're tasked with solving this using NumPy. There is some um, kind of matplotlib. Um, we, we use matplotlib in this uh, exercise. It's a Python library for visualizing um, data. We're not going to focus on matplotlib for this tutorial, but it is helpful to kind of use it to, to look at some of our data. Um, so uh, I try to provide some kind of boilerplate plotting data for you here. If you get stuck, there is a solution. You can look at the solution. Um, but I want to have you try to work on this for the next um, 10 minutes or so um, to try to um, get some practice with NumPy and get some practice with um, kind of indexing. So think about how you could use a slice or index indexing to um, kind of calculate the return um, based off of, of this function here. Okay. So one quick thing, if you didn't know this, um, we're uh, importing some stuff here from NumPy. We're importing these um, functions. If this is helpful in IPython as well as Jupyter, if you don't know what a function does, you can actually use a um, question mark and run that cell and it'll bring up the doc string for you. So that works in um, an IPython session as well as a Jupyter notebook. So I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes to, to go through this, this exercise. Again, there is solu a solution if you need um, to take a look at it because you're stuck, but we're gonna take 10 minutes to do this exercise and then we'll come back and, and I'll review it with you and we'll move into something called fancy indexing. So take 10 minutes and then we'll come back and, and review this exercise.
If you're having um, trouble with the first line because of imports, my hunch is that you either are not in the virtual environment set up by the class or the packages aren't installed in the environment that you have. If you're on Binder, you should be able to launch Binder and it should work. If you're not on Binder, make sure that you're using the conda activate numpy tutorial command before you launch Jupyter Notebook. Just a few things before we go over this um, together. Again, if you're on the, if you look at the repository for this class, um, you can launch Binder by clicking on this. This is the recommended approach. If you can't, if you haven't set anything up, I would recommend launching Binder, letting it load and navigating to these exercises and running it. That's the quickest and safest way to do it. If you want to install these packages and have stuff available locally to run this, you need to follow these instruction commands that are on the repository um, readme file. So this command creates a Python virtual environment with the necessary packages. We can activate this um, created environment using Conda activate. Um, and then you can launch a Jupyter Notebook. So if you don't have this installed, uh, I, again, I would recommend um, using Binder, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and um, start going over this notebook. Again, the first few lines of code are just kind of boilerplate to, to load our arrays. What's nice about this load text function from NumPy is that we can load a CSV file, specify kind of the column we want to use, and define kind of how our data is separated with a delimiter. Here it's a comma, and that'll load it as a NumPy array. So if we um, look at this array, we can see that prices, the load text function has loaded the CSV as a NumPy array for us. So what we wanna do is essentially, we wanna use this formula up here to calculate our return, which is the kind of step before, the current step we're at minus the step before divided by the step before. So the way we can think about doing that is if I'm at this location, I wanna subtract this and divide by this. If I'm at this location, I wanna subtract this and divide by this. So the way we can do that is if I take my first and on, so that gives me everything here and on, right? And if I take my everything up to, but not my last, that'll give me this. And now what I can do is I can use that to create my differences, right? So I can say that my differences are starting at index one, subtracting from everything up to have my differences. So this differences, this diffs array is really my numerator. 
So now what I can do is divide by my denominator, which is everything up to, but not including that last kind of timestamp, which is my um, returns. So my returns, oops, looks like this. There's actually a handy NumPy function that'll do this difference for you. Uh, I have to import NumPy as NP. I say NP.diff prices. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I say NP.diff prices. This will calculate essentially this diffs here. So if I look at my diffs above this, just to compare to see what it looks like, right? These two things are equivalent. My diffs that I created by going from the first index on minus everything up to the last index. That's essentially what this um, np.diff does. And you can provide different step sizes to do that. But this np.diff, and then I can divide, divide by my prices um, up to, but not including the last one, which will give me the same thing as my returns. Okay. So here we wanted to create an array of zeros that corresponds to the length of the daily returns. So again, if you remember, we have a nice Python um, uh, NumPy, I'm sorry, a nice NumPy function called a range where we can say the length of prices. And then our zeros will actually create a zeros array based off of how many, um, oops, this should be returns, can be prices too. So that allows us to see um, kind of a zero line when we plot and do a dot shape as well. Okay. If I were just to plot this, I can see that I get my zero line here and that's essentially why we wanted that zero line so that when we plot this data, we can compare it to something. So we wanna plot our returns, or we wanna plot our days, I'm sorry. And then we wanna plot our returns. We get something that looks like this. Um, the bonus is basically saying that there's some space um, here. Um, so what we can do is we can use the xlim and say that our x max is equal to the length of our returns. This is just um, kind of matplotlib. That eliminates that little space here for us. Okay. If I look at our returns, there's a question in the chat. We can try to say mp.set um, print options decision equals four. Gives us a few more um, less decimals here. So there's some like print options and things we can do as well. So uh, this exercise calculate return uh, is designed to kind of give you some practice with slicing. Um, so any, any questions on, I guess, this uh, exercise before we move on to something called fancy indexing? Okay, not hearing or seeing any questions. So we are going to um, Um, 
go back into my IPython session. Oops. Okay, we are on slide 15. I'm actually gonna go back to the slides here. So we're on slide 15 and we're gonna talk about um, fancy indexing. So fancy indexing allows us to provide kind of a filtering mask to an array or specify certain indices to pull from an array. Um, so with slicing, we kind of had to have some type of pattern that we could express mathematically to grab things out of an array. So it was like the first and second column and then every other column or something of this nature. Fancy indexing allows us to grab things without, um, grab things from an array if they don't have some type of necessary, um, some type of underlying pattern. So in this case, if we create this array using the range function from zero to 80, and you have a step size of 10, that's gonna give us this A array down here at the bottom of slide 15. And fancy indexing would allow us to say something like, I want position one, position two, and position five. There's no real way to express that as using slicing notation. So we can also use something called fancy indexing, where we can create this list of indices, in this case, zero, uh, one, two, and five, or in this case, negative three from the slides. And if we um, index A based off of those indices, that will give us those elements 10, 20, and 50. So this works just like um, normal indexing or slicing where we can get uh, we can set values here. So we can set those places at, you know, this is essentially index one, index two, and index negative three to be 99. But we can also use something called a Boolean mask, where it allows us to index based off of what we call a Boolean mask based off of these kind of locations where a true will return from the array and a false will not. So in this case, a zero in Python and in Boolean is gonna be false and a one is true. So what this is saying is at index zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these values are true. And when we index that A um, array based off of that mask, that's giving us the 99 values, which over here we had set um, based off of that. So if I um, can live code this, I think it would be helpful. So I'm gonna go back to the terminal and we will, um, live code this kind of example to show fancy indexing. So if I have my array where I'm gonna say um, zero to 80 step by 10. So this is my A array and I can say A of one, two, negative three. I can say, whoops, that was <laughs> A of one, two, and five as well. So remember, these are the same thing because zero, one, two, three, four, five is the same. This five index is the same as negative one, negative two, negative three. So this is fancy indexing where I'm indexing by a list or I'm indexing by, um, kind of um, multiple uh, indices here. If I have a, the other thing I can do with fancy indexing is I can actually do, I can repeat things. So if I say one, two, five, 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 what that's gonna give me is the items 
at those locations, but I can kind of do duplication using fancy indexing. So I can reorganize or I can duplicate things as well. I can set things where if I have A of one, two, and five, set them to 99. So that's saying at location one, two, and five, I can set those items to, to 99. Okay. So one thing to note when we do fancy indexing, if I have A, my fancy indexes, they have to be a list or an array. So I can say one, two, and three. I can say A of np.array, one, two, and five. But I can't, what I can't do is something like this where I'm providing a tuple. And that's because um, NumPy is gonna interpret that as indexing for multiple dimensions. So when we're fancy indexing, it has to be kind of this idea, it has to be, we have to provide kind of a list of those, those indices that we want to, to pull out. And the other thing to note is when we create, so I'm gonna redo my A array. I'm going to say um, y is a of one, two, and five. When we create a, an array based off of fancy indexing, we actually create a copy. So remember, when we slice, we're looking at a view, and changing the slice is going to change the originating, the original array. When we do fancy indexing, it's going to create a copy, so that will not change the original array. So if you remember, we have this shares memory function. We can see that A and Y do not share memory. That's because Y was created based off of fancy indexing. And again, if I change Y to something, if I change something in Y, that's not gonna change anything in A because it was based off of a fancy index and it was um, a fancy index will copy our data. So it won't, um, be a view, so we aren't going to be changing things in Y. So I'm going to finish slide um, 15, and then we're going to take a break. So bear with me just for a, a few more minutes. I'm going to get through this, and then we'll take a longer break. Um, so we can also use something called a mask for fancy indexing. This is really like indexing with Booleans. It allows us to pull out elements based on like some criteria. Maybe if we want to grab all the odd or all the evens or something that's greater than a certain threshold, we can do this um, using kind of a Boolean um, index. So again, if I have A and I want to say, um, my mask is an MP array, and I'm gonna say zero, one, one, uh, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. And I'm gonna say my data type is a Boolean. If I look at that mask, I have a bunch of true and false values. And if I do A of mask, that's gonna give me everything in A where my mask array is a true. So this is false, so I don't get a zero. This is true, so I get a 10. This is true, so I get a 20. This is false, this is false. This is true, so I get a five. And this is false, and this is false. Typically, we don't build a mask this way. Usually, what we would do is we'd say something like, is A greater than um, 30? And that gives me a Boolean array. And now what I can do is I can index my A based off of that kind of value or that, that Boolean array. So I could say my mask is a, where A is greater than 30. And then if I want to index based off of that mask, I can do that through what's called Boolean indexing. So fancy indexing allows us to, pro to provide multiple kind of uh, coordinates or locations using lists. Um, for each dimension. And fancy indexing, as far as Boolean goes, allows us to um, create or filter out things based off of a Boolean mask. So we're going to take a break. 
Um, I know I said we're going to do about 15 minutes. Um, we're going to do about um, 15 minutes right now. So um, we're, we're going to return in, in 15 minutes, and then we will continue on picking up at slide um, 16 and finishing kind of our fancy indexing. So we're going to take a 15-minute break and then um, be back. Should be ready now. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone, we're going to continue on um, with fancy indexing. So again, we're on slide 16. I'm going to draw on this slide for a little bit, and then I will live code it. And then we have a short little give it a try for you to practice with fancy indexing. Um, so if you remember, slicing, slicing an array is always going to give us a view. Fancy indexing is going to give us a copy, which means if we have a copy with fancy indexing, um, it's not going to alter the originating array. Um, but with slicing and a view, changing that slice or that view will alter the originating array. Um, but what fancy indexing allows us to do and the power of fancy indexing is allows us to grab elements out of an array, either using a Boolean mask or by um, providing indices or coordinates in that array to pull things out that might not be uh, mathematically expressed in slicing. So again, we have another kind of color coordinated slide where the orange, I apologize everyone. I'm gonna try to stop sharing my video to see if that would help with bandwidth, the bandwidth issue that I'm dealing with here. Um, so again, we have another color coded slide here. Um, the orange specifies kind of this diagonal here where we want to try to grab things out. Now, <laughs> you're going to pretend like np.diagonal, that's a function. You can look that up later. You can pre pretend like that doesn't exist. <laughs> um, you can use np.diagonal to grab this orange slice, but we're not. We're going to pretend like that doesn't exist right now. What the orange slice is doing is it's saying, the first list here is specifying our rows and our second list here is specifying our columns. So really what this is, is kind of a combination of coordinates aligned this way where we have the zero row, the first column, the, the row at index one and the second column, the row at index two, and the third column gives us this. So it's this idea of providing kind of these coordinates using fancy indexing to pull out some of these items. Um, it also works with kind of our um, slicing notation where this light blue is saying start at index three and go to the end of the array, this colon here but only give me column zero, two, and five. So column zero, column two, and column at index five. So that's what that fancy indexing is doing. And then we can also provide a mask, again, a Boolean mask where this is gonna um, return true so that when we provide that mask in the row dimension, that's going to give us essentially row at index one, row at index two, and row at index five, which correspond to the true values in this Boolean mask, and then only the second column. So that's how we're getting two, 22, and 52. Okay. So I'm going to uh, live code this in the terminal so we can see a little more of, of what actually is, is going on. So I've created kind of the array that we have here in our, our slide. If we want to look at that kind of yellow piece, what I was talking about is um, NumPy has a diagonal function where um, if I just provide 
diagonal in A, it's going to give me kind of that diagonal here, but it also has an offset where I could say one, and that will give me that diagonal offset here. Um, but I said, we're going to pretend like that doesn't happen. So essentially what we're doing is we're going to say that our rows, what rows do we want? We want zero, one, two, three, and four. And what columns do we want? We want columns one, two, three, four, and five. If I say A, rows, calls, that's going to give me that diagonal and that orange slice above. So essentially what this is doing, what fancy index is doing behind the scenes is something like this where it's zipping together those rows and columns to give us kind of coordinates. So it's saying row zero, column one, row one, column two, row two, column three, on down the line where it's kind of combining these rows and columns together to give us those specific coordinates. So this is essentially what's happening in the, the orange um, kind of slice. Um, so again, we can use fancy indexing to pull some of this stuff out. The um, kind of reminder here on this slide is that uh, fancy indexing creates copies um, instead of a view. Um, so it's going to be kind of um, a slice because it's creating a view is a little more efficient with memory. It's referencing the same kind of underlying memory Again, if you change something in a view, you're going to alter that original data. But fancy indexing, um, it allows you to be – sorry, everyone. Fancy indexing allows you to pull things out that might not have a specific pattern um, and um, is going to create a copy of your data. Okay, So I'm going to give you the opportunity to um, practice – this um, fancy indexing with this, give it a try on slide 17. Again, you can copy and paste that data to create this array. Um, the first step, what you wanna do is, is create or um, look for these boxes in blue. I want you to extract those from this array. So your output should be an array with three, six, 10, and 19. And then the second part is to extract all the numbers that are divisible by three. Um, in Python, there is a function that is helpfully called the modulus and essentially returns the remainder after integer division. So um, if you have five mod two, that's, that's one. Um, two can go into five two times and the remainder is one. So this modulus or, or mod, um, it's the percent sign in Python. So that's going to be useful in this, this exercise. Again, that returns the, the remainder after uh, integer division. So I'm going to give you five minutes to try to do this. And then we'll um, come back together and, and, and go over this. So take five minutes and um, try to do this, this exercise.
Okay, we're gonna go ahead and um, review. So, this is our A array. So I realized that there's a few ways to do this um, from left <laughs> to right or from top to bottom. So um, essentially what from left to right is gonna be an array of <laughs> 10, six, three, and 19. So we'll, we'll do that one first. Um, so essentially what I need, I'm putting white space in here. This isn't uh, Pythonic, <laughs> if you will, but I'm putting it in here just so we can kind of illustrate what we're trying to do here. Um, the rows that we want, if we wanna go from left to right, are essentially going to be, we want row two. And if we want row two, then we want column zero. That's gonna give me that um, 10 right here. I'm sorry, um, wait a second. Um, not, this isn't right. I apologize, give me one second. A is my range 25, if I reshape. Sorry about that. I do this again, my rows and my columns. If I wanna get this 10, so going from left to right, I wanna get 10, six, three, and 19. If I want this 10, that's gonna be my zero, one, two row. And that's gonna be my zero with column. Six is gonna be my row one and my one column. Three is gonna be zero and my zero, one, two, three column. And my 19 is gonna be my zero, one, two, three column. And my, I can say negative one, or I can say zero, one, two, three, four. So that gives me 10, six, three, and 19. If I wanted to do blue from, let's say, uh, top to bottom, right? That would have given me three, six, 10, and 19, <laughs> right? So I could say, um, I could do the same thing. Let's do, I could say my rows now, if I just wanna specify my rows, I would say zero, one, two, and three. And now if I wanna specify my columns, I would say three, one, zero, four. And now I can say A rows and columns, and that'll give me my three, six, um, 10, and 19. So a few ways to kind of specify in this case. Um, number two is a um, module, modulo or modulus, how um, trying to define what is divisible by three. Now we could look at this array and we could go through and we could look at this array and we could go through by hand and specify what is divisible by three. Um, but a better way of doing that would be to say, where is A, if I did A mod three, that'll give me the entire array um, computed with the modulus three, but I really want is where this is zero. Where this is zero are gonna give me the numbers where it is, A is in fact divisible by three. So if I create a mask where I say A mod three equals zero, now I have that Boolean mask and I can say A mask, and that gives me all the numbers that are divisible by three in A. So I could create that mask or I could just say A mod three equal to zero and put it in there directly this way and get that output. Okay. So it's helpful to know we can do this. Uh, we can access things kind of programmatically rather than having to specify every index or, or every um, column. We can use this uh, mathematical um, operations to filter when we use fancy indexing and, and kind of Boolean masking. 
Um, so this might be helpful when we're working maybe with like an image for image processing, or we might have some threshold color, uh, maybe like a grayscale image. We want everything close to white. So we're looking at like, I don't know where things are greater than a hundred um, for, you know, certain pixel values. If they range from zero to 255, maybe you want something that's close to, you know, that 255 value of white. Okay. Um, How do we do on that? Give it a try exercise. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the slides real quick. Um, a lot of this stuff we've covered in the interest of time. I'm going to try to move quickly through it so we can get to some of the other material towards the end. So um, I'm on slide 18. And these are really some of the um, array creation functions that we have in NumPy. So rather than trying to kind of create arrays on our own, we can use some of these functions to create um, popular kind of patterns like zeros and ones or the identity matrix or things like that. Um, so on slide 19, um, we've kind of, we've covered this um, idea of creating an array but it does default to double precision. So if I have an array of all integers, but I specify just one of them as a floating point value, that whole array is gonna get promoted to um, that float, to a floating point data type, and it's going to default to double precision or 64 bit um, floating point numbers. Um, so essentially what's happening here is there's this idea of like a, a hierarchy. You have Boolean integers, floats, and complex numbers. This is kind of this hierarchy where things will get promoted. If you have integers, but you specify one as a float, everything's going to be a float. You have an array of floats and you specify one as a complex number, everything's going to get specified as a complex number. It's this kind of hierarchy of, of promoting and, and things like that. Um, but it's going to default to double precision for, for floating point values. Again, we can use this D type keyword argument when we instantiate or initialize these arrays to specify what we want. Instead of having it default to 64 bit precision, we can specify 32 bit precision. Remember there's um, eight bits is one byte, whoops, one byte. So when we have one, two, three, four, we have four elements and each of them are eight bytes. Four times eight is giving us that 32. If we're changing that default value to 34 bits, now each of these have four bytes and we have four of them, so that gives us 16. So that's why we're getting the different um, number of bytes in these different arrays. Okay. One thing to note too is um, it's hard to tell here, but there is a period at the end. So if I look at my type of one, type of 1.0, type of one, this might not be obvious, but leaving off the zero here and adding having a dot is going to still be a float here. So a one dot is not an integer, a one dot is a float. So that's why when we see on this slide, that's why we see on this slide, we have a one dot, which is still a float, which is why um, we can specify this you know, as floats as well. Um, there's other data types like an unsigned eight bit integer. That's what we have here. Um, U for unsigned, int for integer, eight for eight bits. If we have, remember eight bits, there's um, one, there's eight bits in one byte. So if we have four items and we have a unsigned eight bit integer, that means we're only gonna have four bytes. This is common in um, image processing to store things this way. And kind of see like the base two and base 10 on this slide. I'm not gonna go into detail here, um, but it's a good example and good kind of visual display on, on slide 19. Um, slide 20, we've talked about kind of the arrange function, but again, this is this stands for array 
range. It's the same thing as the Python built-in range function, but it's going to return a, um, a an array rather than like a list or a generator. Um, we have a we can do a start, a stop value, and a step value when we use that, and we can also specify the data type. Again, we've shown where if you did a range of four, it's going to infer that you want integers. So it's going to give you that data type as integers. But if you use something like from zero to two pi and your step size was a fourth of pi, it's going to give you these as floating point numbers because these, in fact, are not integers. One thing to be careful about is the arrange function due to kind of floating point arithmetic. The arrange function, again, it's supposed to be um, like mathematically start to stop where your start is inclusive and your start is exclusive. So up to, but not including. But if we look, sometimes when we have non-integer step sizes, that behavior is, is violated. We would expect this not to include 2.1 based off of this um, kind of definition. Um, but this is also documented in, in NumPy. And they say, hey, if you're using the arrange function with um, non-integer step sizes, be careful. You might want to use something like lin space rather than doing that. So we're going to, we'll show that um, here in a second as well. Um, we also have ones and zeros, which is essentially just creating an array of ones or array of zeros based off the specified shape that you give it. You can also specify the D type there. Like, do you want um, floating point zeros, floating point ones, integer ones, um, things of that nature and just specify the, the shape. NumPy also has identity matrices where essentially this is just gonna be um, ones along the, the diagonal and you can specify again, the integer um, type or the float type. It's gonna default to floating point, um, but you can um, specify or change that with the, the D type argument that we've, we've seen before. Python does, or I'm sorry, NumPy does have this concept of creating an empty array. This is different than zeros because it's not going to explicitly um, fill this array with zeros. What it has to do it, with, it's kind of creating like placeholders where you have an empty array of a certain size and it's gonna fill that with like very small values or values that have just been garbage collected. Um, it might be faster to kind of instantiate this empty array, but it will take time to actually fill it. Um, so just be careful if you're if you're like looping over something and needing to fill stuff into an empty array, um, you can use empty. But if you want to just fill that array with certain a certain value or a certain constant, full np dot full is a better and more efficient and faster way of doing that. So here we specify um, kind of our shape. So we want our dimension or we want our shape to be two and we want to fill that with five. That'll give us an array, a 1D array with two values of five. Um, but we could do we could accomplish the same thing by creating an empty array with a shape two and then filling it or specifying kind of like all the locations of A and filling it. But again, if you want to do that with just a constant value, this np.full is, is a better approach of doing that, a better way of doing that. So NumPy comes with a lot of different ways to create different types of array. You don't have to kind of always type certain things out. You can use something like the identity or zeros or ones or um, this um, fill or full, um, these functions to create these arrays. Um, there's also something I'll... Um, I can code this. So there's, um, we also have things like lin space, which is a linear space between a start and a stop kind of um, value. So essentially if we did np.lin space from zero to one with a five, this is saying, give me the start and the stop both inclusive and give me five values and give me a linear space between kind of those, those values. 
The default here is actually, um, I believe, 50. So you might want to specify, if you're using this, you want to specify how many data points you actually want between those two things. There's also a log space. So again, I'm on slide 22, mp.log space from zero to one. And if I did five, whoops, if I could type correctly. So what this is doing is actually taking a base. So the, the default base is 10. Um, 10 to the zero here. So this essentially is taking it's the base. You're going from base raised to the start to base raised to the stop. And you're getting a certain number of values here. So this is going from one to 10, but instead of linear space in, in log space. So you can do the same thing here. Instead of base 10, you could do base two by changing the base equal to two here. Uh, the default is 10. So this is going from one to two, five values, but in the um, log space rather than linear space. Uh, so we saw this in the exercise, but NumPy has a nice um, np.load text function as well. The illustration on this slide, um, we have a data.txt file, which essentially has one row that has a header. You have something that looks like it has a percent sign as a comment. Um, one row that looks like data, but it looks like column zero, one, two, like this column looks like we won't be able to use it. Um, we can load this kind of messy data in a text file into an array using NumPy's load text function. We specify the file name. Skip rows is how many rows essentially to skip. We want to skip this first one. So essentially what this is going to do is it's going to ignore this one. We can specify our data type to say, when you read this array in, treat everything as an integer. We can say our delimiter is commas. In this case, we can see that we have commas here in this file. Use columns says which columns you actually want to use in your array. So we'd be taking this one, zero, one, two, and three, and we'd be leaving off kind of this messy, messy one here. And then comments tells you like what, if there's a line that is prefixed with a certain string that you provide to ignore those. So it would ignore kind of this here. And then at the end of this line, we have a comment as well. And what's nice about this is this would load a nice array for us that would look like something like this. Or just that that um, integers are extracted from um, this text file. We can also save an array into a text file. So if we have an array, we can use a, a save text and specify the path or the file name and the array that we want to write to. So really handy to be able to not only read in text using NumPy, but also write to a text file if we want to. So we're gonna move into some array calculation methods. Um, and really NumPy, there's, there's four main rules about um, computations when we're thinking about NumPy and like in the NumPy world. I wanna go through each of these and explain them and then I'm gonna try to give some demonstrations of them um, in, the, in the terminal as well. So the rule number one is the first thing NumPy is going to do when we're doing computations between arrays is to check that the shape, the shapes match in those arrays. And these are really called broadcasting rules, and I'm hoping to get to this later on. But we can't. What's happening under the hood is NumPy is first going to make sure that what you're asking to do between two arrays is valid based on the shape. So if you have a you know, an array with three items, an array with two items, and you um, try to add those things together, that's not going to be, that's not going to make sense. And we can't really do anything with that in, in NumPy. 
So the first thing we're going to do is, is check the shape and make sure that it's um, that the, it's a proper match. The second thing is, and we've seen this, that we're going to do all operations are going to apply element by element on the values. So the addition, multiplication, division, all that stuff. When we have the arrays, it's going to be um, performed element by element. Rule number three, these we have things called reduction operations. So when you think about the mean, we think about the standard deviation, the sum, things like this. When you're reducing the amount of data you have, those are going to be applied to the whole entire array unless we specify an axis. So if we have like a two-dimensional array or a multi-dimensional array, if we call the mean on that, it's gonna take the mean across the whole entire array and give us one number. But if we specify an axis, you know, zero for column, for zero for rows, one for columns, things of this nature, it will give us the mean or the operation across that axis. And we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in, in the later slides. But it's important to remember that the default is over the entire array. Uh, and number four, missing values propagate unless explicitly ignored. What that means is these null values or missing values or things in NumPy, np.nan, n-a-n, not a number. These null values are... Um, treated as np.nans or not a numbers in, in, in NumPy. And those are going to propagate throughout your operations or your computations unless you explicitly use a NAND mean or a NAND sum or something like that that ignores null or NAND values. Um, and I'll show that here in a, in a second. But these four rules govern how we essentially uh, do calculations in in numpy so let me go back to the terminal here and i'll give an example of these four um these four rules so rule let me clear my screen uh rule one essentially what we're saying is we can't have arrays with differing elements and do operations on them so we've got array of one two and three we had an array is maybe five and six. I can't do an operation like this because we can't add these things together in a um, in a smart way. Like NumPy can't figure out how to broadcast these things together. And we're going to talk about broadcasting later on, but these shapes differ. So we can't um, add them or do operations on them. But what we can, if B was just an array of a single value, we could do a plus B, where essentially this array is getting stretched across each of these values. So it is get, it can get, whoops, it can get added. And that's kind of a broadcasting rule that again, we're gonna talk about. Um, but we could also do a plus just five, which is fine too. So. NumPy is going to check to see if the shape shapes match. Hmm. Sorry, everyone. Doing my best. Now I'm just spinning. Um, Eric, can you still hear me? Yes, Can you guys see my screen? Here. Nope. Okay, I'm going to have to refresh. Give me one second, guys. I apologize. Try again. There we go. Okay. So we 
talked about um, kind of rule one, essentially what's happening in this case is B is getting stretched to be an array that looks like this. So that when we do A plus B, NumPy is doing this kind of behind the scenes for us. But when we say A plus you know, two, or I'm sorry, A plus five is really what this should be. Um, this is more efficient than the first because you know, we don't have to um, use that, that copy um, or, or we're not, I'm sorry, we're not using as much kind of memory during that multiplication, that, that scalar rather than that array. So what we can do is we can broadcast. And, and again, there's a slide that we're gonna, we're gonna cover this. So um, rule number two, basically we've seen this being applied like element by element. If we have an array of kind of ones, I guess, and if we have an array of, this isn't a good example. And we can do A times B, that's gonna be our element by element kind of multiplication. We can do A plus B, it's gonna be element by element. Um, we can do things like A divided by B, A times B, A minus B, all these things work element by element, um, in an element by element fashion. If you're looking for some type of matrix multiplication, there is um, NP dot. There's also NP dot mate mole. There's also a shorthand of um, at sign. You can use um, things of that nature. So there is a matrix multiplication if you're if you're looking for that. But again, rule two, things are going to be applied element by element. Rule number three, I have my array. Uh, I want to do this. If I have an array, um, so there's a question about MP dot versus matrix multiplication. They actually reference each other. Um, if you do NP dot and do a question mark, it'll tell you kind of when to use either or, or what's what's happening. But if both A and B are two dimensional, matrix multiplication and kind of mate mole is is what you should use or or A at B. So the docs are 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 pretty good there. Um, but looking at rule number three, if I have this two by three array, if I call A dot mean on this a reduction. I am going to get the mean over the entire array, right? So zero plus one plus two plus three plus four plus five, 15, 15 divided by six is my 2.5. That's a mean over the entire array. But I can specify, I can say a dot mean, and I can say axis equals zero. And what that's gonna give me is the array over the zeroth axis. So again, if I look at my shape, I have two rows, I have three columns. If I specify axis zero, what that's gonna do is it's going to eliminate <laughs> this the zeroth index and return three values. So I'm gonna get the um, average across my rows if I draw a line, I'm going across my rows, and I'm going to get one value per column. If I do a dot mean axis equals one, this is going to get rid of this dimension in my shape. It's going to return two values, and I'm going to go across the columns. So if I draw a line across my columns, and I'm going to get, I'm sorry, everyone. Draw a line across my columns. I'm going to get one item per row. Okay, so um, three divided by three here, and twelve divided by three here. Okay. Unless I specify an axis, 
the reduction techniques like sum, mean, standard deviation, all these things are going to um, behave over the entire array. And the last um, rule, rule four, is this idea of a NAN. So np.nan is an actual entity. But what happens if you add NAN to something, if you multiply NAN to something, you have an array. We multiply by NAN or add NAN. We're going to get not a numbers back. Um, so what happens is if I have A with just one NAN value in it, Here's a. I do a dot mean. I'm going to get a null value. I'm going to get man. So it's propagating throughout. NumPy has something called man mean, where I can specify and say, hey, just ignore your nans. Throw them out. And essentially, what I'm getting is one plus two plus three, six divided by three. Notice I'm getting two here. I'm not getting six divided by four. But I'm not getting um, the denominator isn't based off of like the actual count of elements in A. It does throw out NAN in both um, the numerator and the denominator when we calculate the mean, which is what we expect. So if you're looking to not kind of poison the well, if you will, when you're trying to calculate these reduction techniques, and you have null values, you might want to reach for an np.nan rather than um, just the, the typical um, kind of mean or, or reduction technique. Okay. So we're going to take a five minute break real quick, and then we're going to come back to slide um, 25, which is a really helpful visualization. So um, just a quick five minute break, um, grab a water or a coffee, take a restroom break, and then um, we'll be back in five minutes. Okay, everyone, um, we're gonna finish up um, hopefully try to get through some of these. I'm going to move um, as best I can without trying to confuse anyone too much. So if I'm moving too fast, please let me know. But we're on slide 25. Um, this, When we talk about kind of the reduction operators and specifying an axis, this slide is helpful to kind of visualize what's going on in our multi-dimensional arrays. So when we start thinking about 2D, 3D, you know, 4D is where my brain kind of breaks down a little bit <laughs> or a lot of it. Uh, but this slide is helpful kind of for kind of visualizing how NumPy will treat certain axes or dimensions. Um, so if we start with the, the 1D case here, um, again, if we call a dot shape, that's going to give us the, the, the tuple or, or tuple of four comma zero. And our axis here is, um, the zero with kind of axes. I'll get to the negative axes in a second, but when we move to the, the 2d case, notice that this four moves to the right. So it appears here and um, we have a two by four array and that two gets appended to the prepended to the front of that shape, um, tuple. Also notice that our zero dimension is whatever dimension we kind of just added to. So rather than having zero always point kind of to the right, now our zero axis is, is specifying kind of up and down or these rows. And the one is specifying the columns, the um, axis one. Okay. 
So axis zero is now the rows, axis one is the column. Every time we add a new dimension, that dimension is gonna get added to the front of that shape tuple. So when we go to the 3D case, essentially over here, let me erase this stuff so I'm not so busy. When we move to the 3D case where we kind of have a, a depth dimension kind of in the Z dimension and, you know, if, hmm. Okay, so our zero or Z dimension is now our zero axes. If we look at kind of our X dimension, that's our columns. It's now our second, our two axes and the rows or kind of in the Y direction is the axis one. So you see we have two rows, we have four columns, and then we have kind of this depth of three, it's hard to see, but there's one, two, three going into the screen. This is a really helpful slide when you're first trying to like understand the certain axes and dimensions of NumPy. If we add a fourth dimension, now we kind of have like these <laughs> blocks of cubes. So now this fourth dimension is our zeroth dimension where we're moving kind of across these blocks. Um, our Z direction, which was formerly uh, zero is now one our columns are three and our rows are two. So one helpful way or something that you might see a lot of, you know, if you're using or you're in multi-dimensional space in NumPy, it might be helpful to actually specify your axes using negative, um, using um, kind of negative indexing. The reason for that is the negative one dimension is always going to be your columns. So going across kind of your columns, negative one is always gonna specify going across the columns. Negative two is always gonna be going across your rows. Negative three is always gonna be kind of your depth. So if you're working a lot in multi dimensions, um, you know, if you're in 2D, it might be fine to just stick with you know, zero and one. But if you're working in many, many dimensions, it might be helpful to use some type of uh, negative index when you're using kind of these reduction techniques or, or wanting to look at, at certain things. Okay. So slide 26 is, is helpful as, as well. I kind of coded through this already, um, but this is a nice kind of <laughs> image to, to look at. When we have this array, we have a 2D array, which essentially is this, this image here. If we call a sum, so again, NumPy, if I have my array A, I can use a method. So a method is a function attached to an object, or I can use np.sum. We talked about these universal functions. These are the same thing. So in this case, we're calling np.sum here. But Either if I say a.sum using the method or np.sum on a using the function, I'm gonna get one value returned, which is gonna be 21 here. One plus one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six, 21. If I specify my axis being zero, we're in a two dimensional case. So my axis is going to be pointing you know, down. Essentially what's happening is I'm saying, sum across the rows. If I draw a line, I'm crossing my rows. So I'm gonna cross the rows and give me one value per column. Okay. If I specify axis of negative one, or in this case, I could have said one, but negative one, I'm gonna sum across my columns. So if I draw a line, I'm crossing my columns and I'm gonna get one value per row. Okay, so it's it's helpful to be able to kind of visualize and and see this. Let's see, is there anything else that I want to show here? Okay. If we move on to slide um, twenty-seven. There's a bunch of different um, functions 
that we can use as either methods or functions. Um, you know, sum, product, min, max, argmax, argmin, argmax. Uh, P2P is peak to peak, or just kind of the, the max minus the min. Um, and all these are kind of available for to us, just like we've seen in uh, using like a mean or, or a sum we've seen in the past. So one thing that I wanna go over, I actually, I'm gonna code this up um, so we can kind of go more in depth. I'm on slide 28, slide 28, if you wanna follow along. Okay, slide 28, if you wanna follow along, I'm gonna say np.array is um, two, zero, one. So this is my array. If I wanna take the min of, whoops, <laughs> np.min is not what I wanted to call. I wanted to say a.min or I could say np.min of a, okay? My minimum value is zero, so I can call that as a function or a method. Um, I could also use the uh, a.max, and I could say my axis is zero, where I'm getting the max of the columns in this case, and if I said axis is one, I'm getting the max of the rows in this case. A helpful um, aside, let me see here. Oops. A helpful aside, if you don't know which axis to specify, a way to do this is to call your mean and then look at the shape. And you can say, is this the number that I'm expecting? So if you don't remember and you say, oh, axis zero, is that across the rows or across the columns? I can't remember which one. Are you expecting three values? You can delete your shape. If you're expecting three, great, delete your shape and that's what you want. If you're expecting two values, you know you need to change it to one or, or something else. So this is a helpful little trick to be able to say, what do I actually want my output to be? You can use this kind of dot shape trick. But if I go back to um, what we're looking at on this slide, slide 28, if I wanted to get the location of where the minimum Um, if I wanted to get the location of where the minimum actually is, I could use argmax, where um, this is gonna give me the location, not the actual value. But what is challenging here is, same thing with argmin, I could do the argmin of A. What's challenging here is my A, is a two by two array. So just giving me a one or a two isn't really helpful. We can use something called unravel index where we have the, um, like our location was one and I wanna know where that is in a two by two array or our location was three and I wanna know where that is in a two by two array. This is helpful because it, it maps the coordinate system to the actual array that we're looking at. So I can use unravel this all together and say, I want the A's location of the max, but I want it in terms of the shape of A to give me zero one. So row zero, column one. Or I could say, I want the arg min location based off of a shape. And I can see that I get um, row one, location zero. 
Okay, so unravel index is is um, a very useful and, and helpful tool, especially when you want to try to find um, find the value, find the location of the minimum or the maximum in terms of the shape of the original array. Another really useful tool. So, oh man, sorry everyone. I'm going to slide uh, twenty nine here. Um, so NumPy has a nice function called where. So np np dot where is um, has two kind of uses. One is to find the coordinates of a condition. So if we want to find the values of an array that are say like divisible by two. So if I said a was equal to np dot arrange negative two two. So this is the array on our slide. I wanted to find where a was divisible, or um, yeah, where a was divisible by two. I could do something like this. I could say a where a mod two is zero, or I could say np dot where and provide that condition. And that's going to give me the um, locations, it's going to return a tuple or a tuple depending on my dimensions of A. So because A is 1D, this is telling me that it's at 0 and 2, which is divisible by um, divisible by 2. So np.where gives us the coordinates of locations, um, but it's also a conditional array where we can create arrays based off of other arrays. So if I have an array called positives that I'm going to say is a range from one to five. Sorry, everyone misspelling. Say negatives is just a negative. So this is what my positives look like. This is what my negatives look like. I could say, um, this is my original A matrix. If I create a mask and I say, this is my mask, I could say np.where mask. If it's true, give me the positive values. If it's false, give me the negatives. What that's going to do is, based off of my mask, true, false, true, false. If it's true, it's going to grab from the positives, so one and three, at that location. If it's false, it's going to grab from the negatives. So this is nice because what we can do is if we have, um, um, maybe I want to say A is, I mean, I'll say B is np.array. Maybe I'll do, um, I have a B array and I say np.where um, B is even, give me B, if not, give me a null value. I can do something like this where I say everywhere that B is even, give me what that original B value is. If I want to fill those places where it's not, then give me a null value. So this np.where allows us to do uh, essentially not just to extract, but create an array of the same kind of shape as our initial array based on a condition. So um, this works with you know, we can use a one here, this is zero, all these things to be able to kind of combine and, and create using np.where. So it's a very um, powerful tool um, to use. So I am on slide 30. Any, any questions, Eric? Any questions in the chat um, from anyone that has anything that I can try to answer? I think we're good on the chat right now. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go back to the slides. 
So again, I'm on slide 30. We have a bunch of statistical um, methods or functions that we can use. We've seen the, so again, we're creating an array here. We've seen the, the mean where we can provide an axis here. Um, this essentially is, is looking at across our rows. Is this first one? And MP dot, um, mean is the same thing as, as a dot mean. We've seen this. There's also a standard deviation where we can specify the axis here and there's a degrees of freedom. We can specify whether or not we have a, a sample or a population. There's a variance. Um, all these things are available in NumPy for us that we can use as kind of functions or methods on our arrays. So we have a give it a try exercise on slide 31. I'm gonna give everyone about five minutes to do this and then we'll come back together and um, solve this with each other. So about five minutes and, and then we will solve it together.
Okay, so we're going to go ahead and um, solve this one together. So I'm going to create my array. Go from negative 15 to 15, reshape it so that we have a five by six array, and then I'm going to square it. Uh, that's our array here. So if I want to find the maximum of each row, so I want to go across the columns, I want to get one per each row. I can't do a dot max because that's just going to give me the maximum of the entire array. I need to specify an axis here. And I want axis to be one. I want to go across my columns and get a maximum for each row. If I want the maximum, or I'm sorry, if I want the mean of each column, notice that I have one, two, three, four, five, six values, and one, two, three, four, five, six columns. My axis is zero. I'm taking the mean of this column, this column, this column, this column, this column, this column to get my six values here. Okay. The last one is the position of the overall minimum. I said arg min of a. Or I could say a, I could say a dot arg min. It gives me 15. Um, Again, this is looking at zero, so it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That's not really helpful for us. So what we can do is unravel the index here of a dot argmin. We can specify a dot shape. And that'll give us two, three. So zero, one, two, 0, 1, 2, 3. So that's the coordinates in our two-dimensional space, whoops, based off a 5 by 6 array. If we know the minimum value is 0, we could have said np dot where a is equal to 0. Whoops. And that would have given us two comma three. Second row, third, or the index, the row index three, the column index, the row index two, the column index three. Or we could have said np dot where uh, a is equal to a dot min. The difference between these two is if we had multiple a's, so if I say um, this is only going to give me the occurrence of my first maximum. So if I have repeat values in my array, the argmin or the argmax is only going to give me the first occurrence. Whereas if I have I use where, that'll give me kind of the multiple occurrences here. So if you're looking for more than one occurrence, um, just be aware that you might need to use np.where and set it equal to the max of the overall array rather than just the um, using argument or argmax with the unravel, okay? So we have less than 30 minutes left. I'm gonna cover two slides that I think are most important. Um, we're not going to have time to go through all of them, but uh, there's good resources in here if you want to look through. The exercises have all um, solutions to them, so they're helpful if you want some practice problem. There's other slides in here towards the end that I'm not going to go over that are helpful resources, but I do want to cover broadcasting, and I want to talk about kind of the metadata that are that's stored with arrays. So broadcasting is basically um, the simplest way to think about it is if we have two arrays 
that are operating on the same shape. So I'm on slide 34. If we have two arrays that are the same shape, a four by three and a four by three, when we add them together, we're gonna get a four by three. The second case is pretty common. It's not too tricky to think through, but if we have a four by three and we have a three comma, so again, this is a three comma, what's gonna happen is this smaller array is gonna get stretched across the length of this larger array. So now what we have is each of these rows in this larger array is getting added to this kind of stretched version of this kind of 1D array, and we're gonna get a four by three array. Um, the other thing that's a little more complicated and a little harder to reason through, but if you have a four by one and a three comma, NumPy will actually stretch this uh, horizontally and stretch this vertically so that we actually get a four by three. And NumPy is gonna try to do this by prepending a one. If we can prepend a one and add these things together, um, then NumPy will broadcast and, and check those and, and return that uh, value, that array for you. We saw this in one of our um, example exercises where we said um, A was equal to the NP dot arrange six, is it here. So what's happening here is I have an arrange, a range of six, and then I have a, um, uh, okay, so let me clear this. <laughs> so I have, this array and I have this array. So essentially what's happening is I'm stretching this across each of these values and I'm stretching this row across all of these rows so that my result becomes this six by six array. And I've only specified two kind of um, two arrays here and NumPy is gonna broadcast and stretch that for us. Um, the beauty of this is that it's memory efficient. Um, we're not having to create more rows here or more columns in this case to add these two things together. NumPy is gonna try to do that behind the scenes for us and broadcast those things, um, those things out. The kind of rules for how that is performed are on slide, mm, 33, um, but basically it's this idea of trying to prepend a one to the beginning of those axes. And if we can do that, then it's gonna be like a repeat based off those number of kind of columns or rows. So that's what's happening in this slide, whereas a one is getting prepended, so it's a two, a two dimensional array, and then it's getting stretched or repeated the number of rows that are in this array. Or this is getting repeated the number of columns that are in this array, and this array is getting repeated the number of rows that are in this array. So that's how NumPy kind of broadcasts for us underneath the hood. Um, I know I'm moving fast, I apologize. I'm just trying to get through kind of some of the most important things here. I'm gonna skip over some of these slides, slides, um, what, 30, Let's clip over 30, kind of 37 to 40, 46 is an important slide. So I wanna talk about how NumPy arrays are represented in memory. It's kind of both an advanced topic and a useful thing to think about. Uh, if if you know this, it makes 
uh, a lot of NumPy data manipulation, more simple to kind of think about. So on slide 47, there's this idea of a memory block and a Python view. So, so really this above the line is what we're gonna call memory world. Below the line is kind of this Python world, where in memory, our array is just kind of this continuous memory block where we have like an address and we can point to that address to say, you know, the data starts here. And after this, it represents the NumPy array. But conceptually to us in our mind and to, you know, NumPy, when we're dealing with arrays, we really want this to be a three by three array, but there's no multi-dimensional way to kind of represent this in memory. Um, so what NumPy does is it stores metadata along with this array. And that metadata is on slide 30, 48. And this, these should look familiar to you. The data type, we've talked about that before. So a D type is a metadata associated with this um, data buffer. The n dimensions, n dim, number of dimensions, the shape, all these things are things that we've discussed. And then the data, this data is a pointer or a reference to the memory block. What we haven't talked about are something called strides. Um, strides in this case is the mapping from the kind of memory block or the memory world to the Python or NumPy array representation. It tells us how many bytes we need to cover or go through um, to represent a single kind of element in that array or to go from one element in that dimension to another. So what we have here is a three by three array and the strides of 24 means that we need to go over one, two, three items or 24 bytes to get to that next row. Stride of eight means in order to go from um, zero to one, a new column, we only need to go over one item, which is eight bytes. So essentially this is our way, uh, or this is NumPy's way of taking a memory block, this kind of continuous um, you know, strip of memory essentially, and converting it to this three by three representation is based on the strides. To go from zero to three or to go from one row to another, we have to go over one, two, three, or 24 bytes. Same thing from three to six, you have to go over one, two, three, which is 24 bytes. So this is kind of NumPy's way of storing metadata. It's, it's a way to map from that kind of memory block to a, a uh, Pythonic view of, of this array, essentially. And what's nice about this is when we get into things like the transpose um, and other things that just affect the array structure. So just the, um, if we did a transpose like a dot T, all that's happening is NumPy is gonna swap the shape and it's gonna swap the strides. And it doesn't need to create a new copy of that data because that metadata describes, it's very easy to just swap those things to describe a transpose. So operations that only affect the array structure, not the data, um, can be executed without copying memory. And this is another area where NumPy um, gives us that efficiency that we're kind of looking for is that we're not copying data over and over again because it's smart about the metadata that it's stored. It can point to the same data buffer, but just change the metadata that's associated with it. So the next few slides, slides 51, show kind of what I'm talking about. NumPy has a dot T that stands for transpose. And essentially what's happening is if we create an original array, that's a two by three array, if we call it dot T, all that's happening is the shape is getting changed or swapped, as we can see here, and the strides is getting swapped, as we can see here. So a transpose is a very cheap operation in NumPy because we're not changing the data buffer, it's pointing to the same exact 
data in memory, but we're changing or we're swapping the, um, the shape and the strides. So that's essentially what's happening here. Um, there's some reshape functions in, in NumPy where you can specify, you can say like a, an A dot reshape. You can also just update the, the shape if you want as the attribute. So calling A dot shape works as well. Um, you wouldn't, I mean, there's no real, this is just preference. There's, there's no real performance impact by using A dot shape or A dot reshape. The only difference here is if you're calling A dot reshape, you actually have to call it again. Like it's not in place. Whereas if you just specify a dot shape as the attribute, it'll it'll update in place. But there's no performance difference. Um, however, reshape it has to be consistent with the number of elements that you have. So in this case, we have six elements. Um, you can't reshape an array of six elements to make it four by two. That'd be eight elements. Um, you can't do that. So the elements have to remain the same whenever you're doing like a reshape. Um, Got about 15 minutes left. I'm gonna close with this slide, flattening arrays. And I think that's the last slide to be honest. Yeah, so, so one useful technique for um, NumPy arrays, if we have multi-dimensional arrays, we can flatten them into one dimensional arrays. So essentially what's happening here is if we have a 2D array, we can use a flatten that'll just flatten that whole entire array into um, a one dimensional array. There's two different ways to do this. One is flatten. Uh, we say this is safe because this will always make a copy of your data. It will um, take the two dimensional case, make it into one dimensional, create a copy and then return that copy to you. So we say that it's safe, but it could be expensive. Um, the other technique is Ravel and Ravel is gonna try to do return a view if it can't, it's gonna to try to do a copy. Or if it can't, it will return a copy. So Ravel might give you a view, it might give you a copy. It depends on the way that the data is stored in memory. If it's a continuous block of memory, it can create a, a slice or a, or a copy and it doesn't have to. It, if it is a continuous block of memory, it can create a reference or a view. It does not have to create a copy, but if, it's, um, if it can't do so, it will return a copy. So. Just be aware that there's two different ways to flatten your arrays. There's the flatten, there's the Ravel. One nice thing about Ravel is that it can be used as a function. So np.ravel um, can be used on like lists of lists if you have them, but flatten is only a uh, method. So there's no np.flatten. There's only, if you have an array, it's only called as a method.flatten. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to close um with that. I want to apologize for the um I want to apologize for the slides going in and out. Uh I'm hoping that it was still beneficial for you and that you still enjoyed um the content. There is a lot of exercises and a lot of um slides that we didn't go over, not a lot, but a few towards the back. Um, so feel free to go over those. If you have questions, I'll be monitoring the Slack channel. I've also um, saved the history of the IPython sessions to my computer. I'm gonna be uploading those on the GitHub repo. So there is going to be um, text files that will have the commands of everything that I did in the IPython session. It won't show the output, but it will show the commands. So theoretically, if you went back and redid all those commands in that order, you would replicate kind of what you saw today. Um, so there won't be a uh, output, but there will be the commands that I actually typed in in a text file, and I'm gonna upload those to the um, GitHub repository. Again, there's a Slack channel. If you want to continue conversation after this, I'll post the location of the repository in the Slack channel so you have it. Um, and again, I'm gonna try to upload those sessions to the history sessions to the, the GitHub repository. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. 
Um, I apologize again for the technical difficulties, but um, I appreciate your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, Sci-Fi 2021. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Logan, and thank you, everybody, for attending, and we'll sign off now. Bye.